Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Living in the Limelight, an Anton Scholl and Friends podcast where we discuss music from the artist and fan perspective. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. All right, welcome to another episode of Living in the Limelight. I'm your host, Anton Scholl, and today with me is my special guest, Mark DeChico from the Lights and Light Senders band uh and uh well first of all thank you for joining us i appreciate it how are you today i'm great thanks for having me uh really really excited to be here yeah i was interested because the you had contacted me and i have never heard the term post rock you're talking about the genre of music that you do and and you said post rock and i i literally had to look it up and I had no idea what that was. You'd sent me the, uh, you know, a link for your album, which I appreciate. And I was listening to that and never really heard of that before, thought about it. Um, but then again, after I listened to it, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And, you know, I, I wanted to read what I had had as the uh, definition. Um, So the definition says a form of experimental rock characterized by a focus on exploring textures um, as well as like non-rock styles, but um, over, you know, not really the conventional song uh, style of, you know, all songs. First of all, having a singer, having uh, lyrics, having a chorus, having a, a bridge. You know, all of this stuff in there, um, all of that pretty much goes away. And it uh, and there's not like a standardized riff. And I was listening to it and I was like, wow, that's, you know, fantastic. So really interests me and really something that I want to talk about. So welcome to the show and let's get into it right away with the band. Um, well, the funny the funny thing is um, I'm I'm more on your side of that. Um I'm not original member of the band. They had two prior releases before I came, came into the group and I had uh, relocated from the East coast, from the Philadelphia area out here to Phoenix and done a couple minor things, but I really, nothing had really kind of tickled my fancy. I guess I just, I'm a little older. So I'm kind of my focus of what I wanted to do is a little shorter, but my general background is more of a rock alternative I've done originals, I've done covers, but that's really kind of where I lie. And as you know, some wedding band stuff, which some people will say I eviscerated some Motown songs and hand up. I'm absolutely eviscerated it. Um, But I mean, listen, Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder. All right. You can only get away with so much. (laughs) Sure. As far as sounding as close to what Stevie did with his left hand. But anyway, that's for another discussion. (laughs) Um, By the way, there is no base on superstition. Band leaders, stop telling me. There's bass on the record. It's not. It's a clavicle. <laughs> Moving on. Um, right. So, again, I had no experience with this genre. Um, and I perused Craigslist once every couple months. It, it, it was more for comedy, I got to be honest. But mm-hmm. every once in a while, an ad would go, ooh, wait a minute. And their ad was really well written. And what they were looking for was very specific. And I said, ah, let me let me go check out what this is. Post-rock. I, I, I saw it in the ad and had no idea. You know, I latched on to the rock and hoped that it was something worthwhile. Well, I was, their first two records were up. Um, we have a band camp and I, I listened to that and I was, I was blown away. Um, yeah. Because at the end of the day, I was the way I kind of interpret music, regardless of your genre is, am I feeling something? Is it, you know, am I feeling something, whether it be happiness, anger, sadness uh triggers a memory wh- whatever it is if i'm feeling some kind of emotion that is music to me um so i really kind of dove into it and they have those particular releases have some really long songs um being a progressive music fan this didn't turn me off at all in fact it it, it was more exciting like ooh, nine minutes ten minutes oh okay i i know this territory um but 
it wasn't a lot of content. It was three or four passages that were really super examined to the point of if you come from an, uh, an older generation like I do, where you got hammered a certain way to do songs, um, you know, where's the chorus? Where's the hook? Uh, we, we can't have that guitar solo for 48 bars. It takes too long. And it's it's all about chopping the fat to get to the actual stake of a song, whereas now that's flipped on its head for me. Oh, you want to do another four bars examining that? Well, go right ahead. Um, and as a bass player, even where, hey, you're supposed to hold it together. You you can't be going way out there. You you better not leave that E and A string, sir. There, where are you going? Five strings, six. Str what's wrong with you? <laughs> so again, the mentality, you know, to just throw everything away. And then these guys are like, oh, and by the way, we have a bunch of songs. We're trying to release a record by the end of the year. Like, oh boy, here we. Mm. Well, if I was looking for a challenge, I certainly got it. Um, but man, the the freedom again was so exciting and so scary in in the same breath. In that we were joking before we started recording that I, wait a minute, guys, that's dangerous. I I need a fact checker. I I need someone holding me accountable that I don't put way too many notes and way too small a passage. Right. Um, but it, it turned out, which was weird, over the course of the recording, um, it's probably good I jump right in because I kept some of my songwriting sensibilities. Um, mm -hmm. And I started with a wide net and played some stuff that, yeah, it might have been a little too progressive. I, I might have been trying to enter myself into a, into a realm of players that I, I don't belong in, the, the Pino Palatinos and the Gettys mm -hmm. and the Chris Squires. But, man, yeah. did I try. Um so there was a lot of self editing as we went on, mm -hmm. uh, and the and the band was really great. Sean and and Derek were great about no no that's good. Don't stop changing crap like that. And Sean got to the point where I was doing some home stuff and sending it over to him. Uh, it was mobile. I had my own home little setup, and mm -hmm. I would be like, hey Saturday because we would get together on the weekends and during the week if I could get something done, I would send it over. Um, and I come in Saturday like, hey I, I want to redo. That. I was like, nope, already mastered it. Nope, already done. Don't touch oh. it. You're not touching it. So the self-editing started from the band. <laughs> but well, and you were given you you were yeah. given a clean slate, though, right? You were given Absolutely. kind of like here's the songs, do what you do, and just make it happen. And for you, for a bass player, obviously a fellow bass player, you know, we listen to something, and yes, we have to make that determination whether we want to go crazy without you know, screwing up the, the other parts of the song, because you definitely want to feel the drums. You want to feel that guitar. You also want to feel that bass, but you have to have a compliment to each one of the instruments. And I thought you did a great job on doing that. You know, you could have went in there and went, you know, like you said, complete Getty or complete, you know, Chris Squire and, and kind of became the Keith Moon of the bass. You know, like what he did on drums was like a drum solo through every yes. song. Yes. You know, you, you could have done that, but you you really listened to the music. You listened to what they were, uh, you know, trying to 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 put out there. And and you you felt the song and you put that bass right in that pocket to where I thought it sounded great as a mix. So So kudos to you on that for jumping in. I, 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 words cannot express how truly I, I appreciate that. Um, I think we're all our own worst critic. Um, I think bass players get into a headspace if you do it long enough where these guys are great. I love playing with this band or this, this group of musicians, but we're, we're pretty hard on ourselves. Um, we have our own kind of right. self checklist that, that we follow that I don't think only other bass players would understand that level of scrutiny we put ourselves under. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it exists. Um, so that, to hear that from you, okay, uh, you know, from you is different to me than you know, we just did a, a premiere on YouTube and the fans were able to kind of weigh in as we were listening to it together. And, and But from bass players, from peers, um, you know, we can lie all day long. Oh, I don't know. They don't understand. No, it matters. It always matters when you have a musician that you respect, listen to your stuff and offer that. It, it's a huge deal. So I don't, I don't want to downplay that, but it, I got very lucky with the guys I play with Derek, our drummer challenged me in a way that I was, mm -hmm. wasn't ready for, but man, did I, when the product was done, was I so happy he's who he is and he plays the way he plays. It's, 
it's literally jazz keith moon and that's why i laughed when you said keith moon because he reminds me of if yeah. keith moon said ah you know what i feel like doing jazz now um there's a rock element to it but he he takes it places that i just never thought of and and i love it for a post-rock genre which we're trying to define it's if you want to go there go there and it's up to you to decide if that's something you ever want someone to hear but in the initial writing process it's literally a, a free reign of take it wherever it's going and we jammed yeah. a couple of the tracks as a band and hashed some things out but like i said they were mostly done so Sean, who's kind of the, the mad scientist of the band, he mixed it, he mastered it. Um, he's kind of our recording guy. Um, had, you know, seven layers of guitar ready down. Eight. There wasn't going to be a lot of major changes in the guitars at that point. He had done a lot of uh, groundwork to lay all that stuff down. And it was my mm -hmm. job, which as challenging as it was, was, was amazingly just exciting to me in that. All right, first of all, where's your sonic space in here? You know, where, you know, does your tone fit in? Do you, do you need to flip a mid switch and find a different angle here, depending on where his guitars were, that kind of thing. It was, it was life's an arguing against the keyboards in, in the eighties and nineties with Rush. Like, well, there's nowhere for me to go. There's nowhere for the yeah. guitar. Same kind of thing mm -hmm. was my, my worry. Like these guys yeah. have already established who they are and have fans. I don't, I don't want to be the rock bass player who came in. Oh, what is this? This is a, come on. This isn't post rock. Yeah. I, I don't even know if the criticism would be warranted. I don't know the genre yet. So <laughs> diving into it, uh, the yeah. research helped a bunch. Um, uh, this will destroy you as a post rock group. I was, I listened a lot to based off. I, what I learned about them from the, the money, uh, the movie Moneyball, And there's a song in there called the mighty Rio Grande that kind of, I don't know, I want to call it commercial. I don't even know what commercial success is at this point. You know, um, they're certainly not being on the radio from when I, I was a kid, but um, that song crossed over to a lot of places that people had no idea. They just knew it was instrumental for eight minutes or whatever it is. Uh, that yeah. helped me to kind of dive in. And I just, there's a band called Night Verses that does that kind of thing. Um, there's a couple other ones that are just, I can't remember off the top of my head that just, led the way for me to to get these tracks down and keep them respecting the genre as much as i was a newbie into it and was somewhat ignorant respecting it um what i found was people who enjoy this music and listen to it are very dedicated very knowledgeable um you you can't pull the wool over their eyes you can't get away with faking it because it's all based mm -hmm. on emotion so if you're not putting your emotion on that well i can't say tape anymore that digital copy of what you're recording they're going to call you out on it and i saw that in different reviews of other records and stuff so uh, there was a bit of a fear for me like don't screw this up dummy you've been you've been trying to find something yeah. worthwhile to do like put so i i got it done and i was kind of was able to step back after it was done and said you know maybe it's age maybe it's just perspective but this this is absolutely the best thing i've ever done from from a bass player perspective mm -hmm. i was so i'm still so proud of it so so i'm so excited like whoever wants to talk about it let's mm -hmm. go i i i don't know if i'm going to be able to do this again so let's enjoy this yeah. but we're already writing for the next record so i mean who knows <laughs> well you know the the thing i was thinking of too when i was listening is you know did you ever think in your in your process of listening to these songs and going through them, did you start to kind of get to the point to where you were like, okay, I'm a I'm a bass player, uh, I'm a four string bass player. Uh, this opens me up to other things. Can I use a five string, a six string, an eight string? Can I go cheap trick and go a twelve string? You know what I mean? Like, was there was there a bunch of different things that were swimming? through your head you know okay wait bring that all back i'm you know anything like any of those thoughts in your head at the time the the main i went that way but not with the strings i went that way with the effects i got very excited mm -hmm. about i can try any box i can afford now at this point now look the wife was scared and rightfully so i i had a credit card and then i found you know wait i can make payments like sweetwater american what uh so the a wife danger. was nervous and 
Right. I redid my pedal board probably three, four times um, in the course of this record. And, but it ended up as much as I started with a wide net, I got it down to about eight pedals and it was literally changing out one effect for another. For instance, I got rid of my big muff and I went to a sub octave bass fuzz, which is not a huge, but there's an added element of the octave and whatnot. I changed mm -hmm. out my chorus because I, I wanted a, a, a different kind of chorus. And then the only pedal that really stayed was my compressor, my sonic maximizer, which is, which I'll die without that. That and my sand damper. Just if I don't have those, if they get lost. Like I'm mm -hmm. at Sam Asher, we're not playing the gig. Like I got to have those two pedals or I will literally, I, I will <laughs> freeze up. Yeah. Um, those, and then I ended up, I have a mono synth, which it just didn't make the record. But man, I tried it on. Hey, I tried on every track, man. I just couldn't, I couldn't find a place for it, but I tried. Yeah. Um, I'm a big, like I said, I'm a big tool fan. So okay. the, the simplicity in what they do, even though, yeah, there's Dan Carey does the odd time signature, but if you really break it down, those riffs are foundational. Like they, so Justin Chancellor, I think he keeps it pretty simple effects wise. Delay, chorus, a little bit of overdrive. I I marvel at what he does. So I've always been a delay guy. Um, and I I found I found places to use that. But I the only thing I ever did as far as bass wise and string wise, for a couple seconds there, I thought about trying to Doug Pitnick. I I did consider maybe grabbing an eight string and i think he's even got a 12 string now or something crazy mm -hmm. um but doug pinkett plays that eight string in king's x and that is always i've always marveled at mm -hmm. okay one how is he doing that and number two how does it sound so ridiculous and i was lucky to have a conversation one time and i'm waiting for this why well, have this pedal and this compressor and this and, and doug said nope that's an old pv rig that's how i got that and i went wait what what, <laughs> what? yeah He's right. got an old eighties PV head he uses to get that drive. And I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm out here blowing five, 600 bucks on dark glass and all this boutique. And here, here's Doug right. who would know better than me. And he's plugging into a PV. So, and what's sad is I think we all probably had that equipment very cheaply back in the day. We, it just yeah. got discarded or traded in. And now we could have got, you know, I, the prices I see on these things is just ridiculous. Right. But yeah. So, well, yeah, I mean, I went more effects, but in the end, I ended up relying pretty much on what, what I consider to be my bass tone, which is a little mm -hmm. bit of the Sans Amp, depending, that Sonic Maximizer, and then I have an MX or a dual compressor. Yeah, All right. well, you know, when you look at a lot of the bass players, we're talking, you know, back in the day when a lot of these pedals weren't available, you know, the biggest thing that they did, we're talking probably John Entwistle and starting out with Getty Lee. Uh, you know, all that they did was crank the amps up, crank up the gain, crank up the treble and bring the bass down. Whereas, you know, when we were first starting bass, it was always about got to have that, that boomy bass sound. And when these bass players came up with this twangy sound, this fast twangy sound it was like, wow, what effect are they using for that? You know, a distortion yeah. pedal, something. And it turned out it was just crank them crank that treble up you know and you can experiment a lot with just those tones on what on a lot of those old amps which uh you know makes it sound great well i i laugh because and i try to if, if i run into young players i i try to stress this almost to kind of grab them and shake them like listen to me i don't care what the promotional thing says for that pedal or that effect all right you're not going to sound like getty you're not going to sound like Chris Carter. You're definitely not going to sound like Enter Whistle. And there's one simple reason yeah. why: your fingers are not theirs. Yeah, I've tried it. People I respect try it. The closest thing I've heard to Getty, and and nobody's been remotely close. There is a Rush cover band called Why Why Not. Um, yeah, there's a guy. He actually Pardon works me. works at uh, Tech Twenty One. Tim Starchy. It's the closest I've heard. And apparently Getty yeah. has heard it and, and said, made a comment to something to the effect of, uh, I want my fingers back. Um, <laughs> Tim yeah. gets it as close as I've ever heard it. Plays the Rick, plays the jazz, uses a Sans right. amp. Well, now he's using, obviously, Getty's signature model. Sans yeah, amp. right. But again, you can plug that thing in, 
fire up yyz and and you're gonna wonder like well why don't why don't i sound like getty i don't understand i've got all the setting right it's your fingers it's always going to be your fingers that's where everything starts right. and ends is how you attack the strings and the notes and there's right. no right or wrong way there there's a basic don't get me wrong where, where you fret your notes and, and but even then i think i think victor wooten's kind of always been a guy who said no there's no wrong you play a yeah. long wrong note keep playing till you hit a right one you know it's and i kind of agree with that there's no wrong your mistakes lead to learning, which leads you to where you're most comfortable. Um, nobody's perfect. Um, right. You know, I, I just, well, I've always not been a fan of something being so regimented or play the scale, play yeah. this figure. Say, just fiddle, find time to fiddle. I've discovered more about the bass fiddling than I ever did reading a book or going over a lesson. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a big part too, that with a lot of bass players that I've seen, uh, who are especially trying to do like rush or something like that is I see them playing. And of course, you know, they're never going to play with a pick. I get that. But when they're playing, they're, they're playing with two fingers and they're trying to play, but Getty, he goes back and forth on the same string. So he'll go back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. While other players are trying to do this with the two fingers, Getty's doing it back and forth, back and forth. And that's why he's getting that type of a tone. And it's very, very difficult for people to do that. But, you know, you got to find out these little kind of nuances that people do. And yeah, it is. It's in the fingers. It's in the feel. I mean, you can get any one of these guys on a piece of garbage uh, guitar <laughs> and, a, and an amp and they're going to sound great, you know. So, yeah. So there, there's obviously a lot to the to the feel. And, you know, I wanted to also talk about uh, with that, your particular influences back then we were talking about you know rush uh, uh being an influence and when you look at like what you're recording you know certain things do kind of come to mind and even though you didn't write this particular album it was kind of like the feel of it because rush fans they want they were kind of expecting for that instrumental to come out you know when we heard yyz or we heard la via Stangiato, you know uh you know we we wanted to hear that type of a of a of a song to come out and then you hear things like hemispheres you know the whole beginning of hemispheres you know which which just phenomenal music wise you know did you have any Absolutely. kind of uh influences in mind when you were coming up with these bass lines or did it was it just clear my head of, of everything I'm just diving in with my stuff. I, that's a, that's, that's actually a, a deep and loaded question. Um, there was no direct conscious thought to, Oh, this part, I'm going to try to sound like Justin from tool, but this part, I'm going to try to sound like Getty, you know, or this part, I'm going to try to sound like Steve Harris. That, that wasn't necessarily a, a thought process. Now, that being said, going back and listening to it after the fact i tend to i really like to run fills off of octaves when it's something a little quicker or if i'm trying to i guess almost pull the wool over your eyes in a sense in that i'm in a very basic position and i can go a lot of different places without getting too far away from where i need to be and i feel like i i'm very comfortable there and i can do that without a lot of thought and um kind of have a couple different directions i'd like to go but i i stay pretty close to that octave wherever we're at um and i felt like that has always been something i've done now when i go back and listen um i tried a couple variations where i to myself was like "Ooh, that's that's a lot closer to signals getty like <laughs> and and i happen to be listening to that record a lot right before i got into the light sender so i have a feeling by osmosis um, I picked up a lot of late eighties Getty into the sure. fills. Cause I tend to do that. Uh, whatever I'm kind of listening to. I also listen to a ton of police, uh, around that time. So Derek's way of playing the drums mm. really led into at least the rhythmic aspect of, you know, that reggae and that almost swing that Stewart and, and Sting had going on, on certain police tracks. So I think those things crept in. Uh, the fun part of it was there are certain things that I, I used to be a pick snob 
and not use them because I'm like, well, you know, the tone and, and the finger roll off the string and I don't, the pick is so harsh and we're bass players. It should be well-rounded. You know, I got away from that. Luckily, <laughs> uh, this record, I tried everything there. There's a couple, there's two tracks on the record. I play with a pick because I tried to win my fingers. And just at the end of the day went, it's just not driving it enough. Mm-hmm. It, you know, yeah. I, I don't necessarily need to scratch the pick across the strings, but I just wasn't. And I was literally, in fact, that was the only time I thought of one bass player. And I was thinking of eighties, uh, you two. Like, I was trying to get that Joshua Tree rhythm section kind of Clayton drive. Like, him and Larry just would lock in, and it wasn't just three root notes. Like, uh, Clayton is so underrated. Just, I'll I'll consider all day. I hate when people don't respect what he does. But he takes a regular, a simple Mm -hmm. three-note progression, throws in maybe two or three more, and just changes the entire dynamic of the rhythm section. So... Right. That was one thing I particularly had in mind, like, ooh, that's what I want. That 80s U2 where they were just locked in. Like, Joshua Tree was just top five all time for me. Anyway, that was what I was looking for. So I used a pick, uh, stay with the Lakeland, which luckily my 4402, it just I can dial in just about any tone, like a similar P, a similar J, a similar music man. Yeah. The, the single double pickup, and that, and I have the LH uh, pickups in that one. It's not the Bartolini. So I prefer it. Uh, I'll never get rid of it. I'll buy three more if I see a good price on them. Um, Because I tend to prefer jazz bass and then, well, thanks, Getty, uh, and (laughs) the the Lakeland. But, I mean, and I only went jazz because I I couldn't do the neck early on when I first started playing bass. That's the only reason I didn't do precisions. Why does it got to be so thick? Mm. Oh, wait, what's this jazz thing? Ooh, that's easier. Uh, and then I play Lakelands, which are somewhere in between a P and a Jazz anyway. So it, it all ended up working out. But that was the one time. Everything else was more a feel and effects. There's a couple of things that aren't, I would say, normal bass lines on the record where I got to use delay. Uh, there's one intro that's where I got to use that sub-octave distortion pedal where I that took two hours. Like, no, it's got to be right. It's got to be perfect. It was probably right an hour and a half before that, but I just I couldn't let it go. Um but I got to use my delay a ton on this record. And um, I think it's root root or suit. I always get them mixed up because they're so similar, but I, I talked about on the podcast where this part just Sean had sent me the baseless tracks because Sean played bass before I got there and he did a phenomenal oh, job. Okay. So it's not like the band wasn't set. Uh, it was only Derek and Sean before I got there. He sent it me without the bass. And I, I just heard this delay thing where the bass could step up front kind of tool inspired but the thought mm-hmm. of it was more rushy and and how i've tried to uh attack the progression of how sean had structured over the guitar and, and he paid me the greatest compliment when we got to I just say like, you just took the bass of places i never would have thought it should go and it just it just makes the record what it is <laughs> and he literally was like i don't want anybody ever else ever playing bass on the record and i went all right i retire like that i don't i'm not going to top that <laughs> right. so you know, I so again, I think it was more effects and feel than influences. But I mean, my first guy was was Steve Harris. I mean, I love Rush. I got into it later, but my my first yeah. guy was Steve Harris. Like I I wanted I don't know what it was about you know Maiden and and it was again this is late eighties so this is somewhere in time. This is Seven Son of a mm-hmm. Seven Son, and I just, there was something about that gallop man and that that P would flat sound that just was like ooh. Yeah. You know, and I just, I just latched on and then, and then, you know, come to find out later years, like everybody tried to do the three finger. It's not, mm-hmm. it's literally two and sometimes one. It's, it's basically yeah. Steve Harris is a bass paradiddle for drummers and, and he never does one, two, one, two. Yeah. So I used to get in arguments like, no, it's only two figure it out. Well, I used three. Well, yeah. Do? Nobody can play with two. Play I think a trooper big with two fingers part- and then come see me. Yeah, I could see that with I could see that with him. I I know that a big part of like Steve Harris, what he would do is he did a lot of octaves. So he would have a lot of open A hitting with the octave A and then he would always throw in is it, you know, that that fifth note. So he would always do like rolling and then do the boo doo 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 doo. You know, there was there was always that little riff that always worked. 
It works everywhere when he does it. But when he throws in that octave with that, with the open string, and then even the, uh, not even the octave, but when he just throws in the open A with holding down the A, uh, just it, it, it really, it really opened up a lot. And a lot of bass players caught on to that. You know, they were like, wow, that's, it, it, it seems so simple, but it really fills the song and really does the job, you know? I mean, it's you funny know? how yeah. if guys aren't Harris fans or Maiden fans, they often dismiss it rather quickly. And it's just oh, like, yeah. listen, go play it. That's cool. You don't have to like it. I get it. Now, it's not for everybody's got their own thing. That's cool. But go play it and then come talk to me. Like, don't judge until you try it. Yeah. You know, like there's some jazz guys. I don't. I'm not even going to try to play it because I already, I'm not doing that. There are Steely Dan songs <laughs> right. I've been trying to play for 25 years that I'm never going to get. You know, Digital Man, yeah. I think I finally sat down and learned that a couple of years ago. Uh, there's just certain oh, songs yeah. where it's like, nope, I'm just going to enjoy the song for what it is. And, and But yeah. Harris was one. And, the, and then I think the other thing that became a huge influence, and I only realized years later, when I was 14, 15, 16, I was a metal kid. So I had the jean jacket. I had a Megadeth patch. I listened to a lot mm -hmm. of metal. Um, but, you know, you always needed a ride to the mall. And, and my my dad was usually the one to pick us up. So my dad was a huge Motown fan. And my dad was a huge James Brown fan. And as a 15 and 16-year-old kid, I know everything, right? I don't know why we listen to this music. But he, he kept listening to it. More probably to drain me out than to torture me. But still. <laughs> Yeah. And then as I started to get older, I, I really started to, when I first started playing bass, I wanted to know everything. It was, you know, new obsession. So obviously very quickly, you're led to the road of, of the altar of, of Jamerson. If anybody says the word bass and I was, you know, finishing high school. So the band cats are like, listen, stop with that metal. Listen, I'll give you two names. Go listen to Mingus and go listen to Jamerson. And I did. And, and I'm Mingus. Right. I was like, I can't play an upright. Why does this interest me? All right, my bad. I, now I know why my, my fault there. But Jamerson was like, oh, wait, I know these songs. And then the more I listened to it, the more I would always hear the bass. Even before I really knew how yeah. to play the bass, I would always hear it. There was like 80s yeah. new wave stuff. I used to love Duran Duran. I loved Kajagogo. Right? Too shy. That, that bass line's sure. iconic. Oh, yeah. And people just Absolutely. heard synthesizers. I, I heard bass. And I started the bands I liked in the 80s were before I even touched an instrument. But it was it was John Taylor, like I said, Kajagogo. You know, it was, um, oh, man, what's wrong with me? Mark uh, Mark King, uh, you know, level 42 and, and, and all this weird stuff. Yeah. But they always had a cool bass player. Yeah. And then learning about it, you know, there was a kid who moved to my town. I think it was eighth grade. was a great guitar player, just ahead of his time. We used to call him Ingve Jr., Ingve Malmsteen Jr., because he did all this neoclassical <laughs> stuff. I mean, I credit him because I said, I want to learn guitar like you. And he says, don't play guitar. Everybody wants to play guitar. Go play bass. Okay. Yeah. You know what you're doing, obviously. Let's try that. And I just, I took right to it. Um, but I, I give that guy credit because we all fawned over, you know, now I'm in the Harris. Kind of no rush. I mean, I know who Getty is. I'm learning Jamerson. Yeah. And then the first Dream Theater record came out. When dreams and day mm. unite, that was the first one. Don't give me images and words. Well, I know <laughs> the old singer yeah. on the first one where you can listen to Yitzy Jam. Mm. And we got that cassette. We had cassettes. <laughs> I think it was Mechanics Records or something. And we heard whispers about these guys from New York, from Brooklyn. And mm. we got the cassette. And when, when I tell you, we all sat around a boom box in the woods somewhere with you know, a 12 pack, somebody's uncle had snuck us a, like Natty Light or something. I, I don't remember some cheap beer <laughs> and, and everything changed. Yeah. Everything changed in that instance to the point where we played our, we were seniors. I think we were seniors in high school. Do you understand? I'm not sure. But anyway, we decided to play our, our senior year talent show with no singer. And we wrote two songs that were probably eight, nine minutes long a piece <laughs> just based off of that. You know, and this is 1992. This is this is Nirvana. This is Pearl Jam. Yeah. This is not progressive music at all. Uh, I have a right. VHS tape somewhere, and I I keep that under lock and key. No one needs to see that. 
But the funniest thing of that whole thing was a friend of ours had moved to Florida and moved back about four months before this talent show and came back a ridiculously talented bass player. And I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> I ended up learning drums to play that show. Uh, I played it on drums, which is the most ironic oh. thing ever. But um, yeah, short-lived career trying drums there. And then after that, when I graduated high school, I tried Rage Against the Machine type. And yeah, no, I'm a bass player. Knock this off. Sold the kit, got back on bass uh, anyway. Um, but that, that kind of changed our mentality. We stayed... I was in all the shrapnel guys. I was in the shrapnel guys that these kids, they don't even remember. Like nobody remembers Michael Lee Ferkins. He only did one record on shrapnel. He was like a country metal instrumental guy. Mm. Um, you know, Greg Howe's early stuff. I, I His first record with Sheen was was ridiculous. I still listen to it to this day. Yngwie Malmsteen. Uh, and then obviously yeah. Satriani crossed over and, Eric Johnson, I, I loved Stevie Ray. So I was I was a guitar guy playing bass. Mm -hmm. So I was into those things. But then then as I got older, I started playing in cover bands and things and learned other stuff. But the the Motown was the thing that always I always thought pushed me in the right place. And then I took lessons with Anthony Wellington in my late 20s, early 30s, who is uh was Victor Wooten's tour bass player. So everything Vic could do, he could do. Yeah. Uh, also had a sponsorship with Federa. And Anthony changed everything for me from perspective. I, I often joke that um, up until that point, I was playing bass. When Anthony got me on the right track, I became a bass player. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a big difference between the two. And sure. if you don't believe me, watch watch any cover band, at least in the Valley, with the bass player. And, and you can pick out he's a failed guitar player pretty quickly into this set. <laughs> um, right. It's just a rhythm that we have that, Guys from yeah. just jumping off a guitar just don't have it. I, I'll, I'll I'll die on that hill. Um, but sure. that changed everything, and I got into Vic. I got into the Offset Jazz guys. I got into the, you know, Steve Bailey's of the world and and Vic's, mm -hmm. and um, just was like, wow, John Patitucci. I went and saw one of his clinics. It was like, I quit because he literally he literally hung me out in the clinic. Like, how do you not learn piano? Well, yeah, I, 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 I've heard that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I got. I had him right, right up to me, like, you know, you made a mistake. I was like, apparently, yes, sir. Right. Um, so, you know, but <laughs> the thing I always stopped short of was like the five and the six string and taking taking the scales and the progressions way out past the four strings. Yeah. I have the five now. I'm back on it, but I'm I'm done at five. Um, sure. I, I, you know, but the five is out for this record. Uh, I, I've had to guarantee Sean okay. and Derek that the new stuff will at least, I will at least attempt to uh but i had a five string built with the same pickup configuration as my lakeland so it's a it's a it's a humbucker single um oh, so okay. that's got emgs in it so it's a little bit anyway i'm getting yeah. inside baseball here but yeah i'm i'm gonna try, i'm trying everything i possibly can uh going forward as well mm -hmm. as writing this stuff because i finally feel comfortable in the genre uh yeah. I, I guess it's a self self created fear of I'm going to go on a message board or I'm going to see a record view and be like, well, that guy doesn't understand post-rock. Listen to his bass lines. And that's like my nightmare moment where you wake up like, oh, God, you know, in, in a sweat. Like, right. I don't want to be that. I don't want to ruin what these guys have built before I got here. Right. So well, you, you certainly did. You great. certainly didn't. Um, but I, I did want to ask a question in regards to the, 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 the whole post-rock thing because this is going to be a real stupid question i'm going to just i'll tell you that there right, no stupid, right now hold on out there are no stupid questions <laughs> there are only stupid answers all right well then let's see how you answer this one because it's funny because when people let's say grow up with the era of music that we've grown up with where it has all been your standard music your lead singers your chorus your bridge all that okay how do you remember the name of the song that goes with that music when usually it's learned by the uh, chorus or learned by, you know, a verse? Did, was that an issue for you in some way? I just, I just did it earlier, about three minutes ago. I couldn't remember if it was Root or, or Suit was the song that I... No, yeah, right. I just, yes, absolutely. That's what made me it's, think it's of it. It's still an issue. Yeah. Um, okay. 
luckily repetition really helps because that was actually a concern of mine. Maybe not so much the title, but my God, these it's so long. And when does it change? And 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 Sean was pretty creative. And every once in a while, I just take a four four and make it a three four out of nowhere, and not in a place where normally I would expect it to be. So. It's, uh, making notes yeah. like you should see the notepad I have for my audition where it should have been a page. It's probably four or five. Like where I literally made little notes mm-hmm. myself, like don't miss this change here. Um, stuff right. like that. So, but it was weird because as we wrote it and, and we started to play it and even through just, I mean, I'm obsessive anyway. So I think I tried to, the least amount of times I did a take was probably five on, on a bass track on the record. Always oh, felt like I'd do it better. Always want. Oh wait, wait, wait. What about this note? So yeah. I, by osmosis, got a lot of good repetition. Um, the thing is, we're not, we're not a live band yet. Um, we're not the type of band that's going to take the bar gig. Um, you know, the smaller gig. The, right. the hey, just come down and play for for promotion. You know, we can't pay you. We don't have to take that. Being being older, being pretty secure, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a really good job and the guys in the band. There's a vision we have for if we're going to do this live, we're mm-hmm. going to have a really big light show. It's it's We want the presentation to be the same kind of thing as the emotions that to, – to, to reflect the emotions that we feel in writing it and presenting it in the songs the way they are. And the mm-hmm. three of us on a stage without a ton of backing tracks or lights or, or – you know, a, a film score of some sort behind us. Like it doesn't, it feels like we're cheating the audience in a sense. So we're all pretty united on, mm-hmm. we're going to do it, but not until yeah. we're all happy with it. So I know sure. Sean has a, a, a person he's brought into the fold. That's really good with automation, uh, like mm-hmm. guys. So we're already working on it. Plus we're trying to find right. a couple extra musicians to recreate this as organically as possible. So we're going to need about 47 uh, guitar players there when we, <laughs> when we take it on the road. Right. Uh, hopefully only one bass player, but well, who knows? Who yeah. knows? If I start double tracking things and do rhythm and lead takes, on, I, I have no idea where I'm going with it. You know, I right. may try that. I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, I think that would be great hearing that live with whatever musicians you have uh, behind you. Where is it that uh, people can now go and find this? So talk about the album. Uh, where can people go to get this? So it should be on all your major streaming services. Uh, it'll be Apple, Spotify, wherever, wherever you get your stuff. Um, but we do have our main page leads right to our band camp, which we prefer only because the artist gets more of the take than some of these other uh, streaming services. But if you go to the, the lightsenders.com, it'll take you right to our band camp page. Uh, Our entire discography is up there. I think on Fridays, they do every Friday is a a creator Friday. They do a sale where I think you can get all three of our records for like 15 bucks. Um, Just, you know, I probably shouldn't tell you that, but trying to save everybody a dollar. We just got our merch store linked in there off the Spotify, Apple, and also the Bandcamp. But Bandcamp is the best place to get it. And you can stream it. Um, Where post post rock dwells is a youtube channel and in the woods are the two that did the premiere for the record those premieres are still up on youtube so hey listen try before you buy go listen to it on there they were it was really cool that they were able to stream it in its entirety because we kind of wrote it as a not as one piece of music but in that order we felt that was you know it tells kind of a story uh it's a, it's a concept record um so, you know, those are places where you can go listen to it. Um, I joke with the guys that I joke because I played on this one, but uh, our last record is still one of my favorites. I didn't play on it. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping we get to do that live because then I get to put put my they, they already said I can put my own bass lines to it. I, oh, I joke with them like oh, I'm going to need like three weeks to rewrite everything. But look, between you, me, and the audience, I'm, I'm not changing what Sean did. It's pretty damn good. That's what wanted me to join the band in the first place. So I'm not, I'm not that ego. Maybe 20 years ago, but not now. Uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So, yeah, if you go to the lightsenders.com, uh, you'll see our band camp. We also have a companion podcast we put together for the exact reason that you and I were like, well, what's post-rock? What I said, hey, can we just get yeah. together and record? Maybe it'll help 
usher some new people in because a lot of my friends are going to be like, what, what do you mean? So, and I felt like we did a pretty good job of trying to explain how we saw post rock and how we approached as far as writing music. So on Spotify, Apple, uh, if you go to our Instagram, which is the light senders at the light senders, there are links to that podcast on a bunch of different uh, streaming services. So that's a good introduction. If you don't know post rock, um, we'd love for you to you know, take an hour of your time. And listen to that podcast. We talk about the band in the first half. And then the second half, we talk about making uh, the newest record. Uh, which I've, I've fought with the band that next time we're only doing single syllable words because pronouncing this thing, I have to look up the pronunciation. Uh, it's I'm a, Welsh, ask you that. it is a tree, uh, based in Welsh. Uh, it's grown pretty much over in England and in, in, in Welsh, uh, called the Thanger new you. So the name of the record is the burning of the Thanger new you. Now this particular tree and Sean, I looked it up. Don't get mad at me. Um, tends to die and split off and, and form different kind of, I must want to say deteriorated looking branches and roots sideways. And there's all kinds of crazy ways. Mm. The reason why that's significant in the, in the title of the record is because the record is basically, we want to leave it open mostly to interpretation. We don't want to tell you how to feel when you listen to it because mm. post rock's an emotional thing. But the basic gist of the story is, it's basically a world coming to an end and mm. the, the struggle of something dying and something then being created from that. So it's, it's one thing dying where another begins its life. So that turnover, you know, yeah. that evolution of sorts is really mm -hmm. what the record's about. It's, it's a planet basically dying. And what comes after, what does it turn into? What, mm. what life starts when one ends? Um, and yeah. that's and that's all I'll say. We want to <laughs> yeah. try to leave as much up to interpretation as possible. Uh, that that's a big deal. I'm learning uh, in the. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up because that was I, I'm I was trying to kind of go in. I didn't want to say like, so what is the name of the album? Because I'm looking at the name of the album for the longest time, and I'm like, I have no idea how to say this. So how could I, how could I ask him how to pronounce the name of the album? Uh, well, well, I should. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, you know, we we actually have, you know, a band text. So as you can see, well, you can't, but but Sean sent me the link to the pronunciation with voice on it, just to make sure okay. I didn't jack that one up. But again, yeah. you're not the only one. I'm in the band, and <laughs> I need to confirm such things right. so I don't embarrass the two guys, the other two guys that I yeah. I hope they forgive me. <laughs> I just call it the you. That seems to be, you know, well on oh, you. Easier. So it's that, that last yeah. word of the whole title. And it makes me sound right. very intelligent, but really I'm just cheating the whole process. I'll be right. being honest with you. Yeah. Well, Mark, I appreciate this. Uh, we're getting to the end of the, the, the podcast here because the time is going to run out. But I got to tell you, uh, you know, this is my first time meeting you, but uh, I want to get back together. We need to do another podcast. We need to talk about uh, as, you know, It'll be like a bass player special. You know, we need to talk about the bass. We need to talk about Rush and our influences and all of that kind of stuff. There's a whole show that we can do on that. But I did want to make sure that we did at least a podcast on talking about the whole post rock and what it is and the new album. Again, best of luck with that. We'll try to push that as much as possible. So, you know, everybody out there, uh, look at, listen to on Spotify, find them. Uh, just, you know, look up light senders and uh, just take a listen to this. I know a lot of people may say, well, I don't really don't want to do stuff without vocals, but, you know, listen to it. It's something that you're really going to get into. And when you start interpreting it, you know, you're you're going to love it. So, Mark, appreciate you being here. And uh, we definitely have to get together again and uh, and talk about, you know, our own things. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, just the record's 38 minutes long, folks. So for you nervous about. It, we did it this way on purpose. It's a good introduction. You can pick a song and just play it. You don't have to listen to it all the way through. So that on that, as far as the rush and the bass, listen, I expect, I expect an invite in any bass conversations. I love talking the instrument. As you can tell, I, I am a proud, proud bass player. And, and I don't even admit that I fit on guitar to write. I I'm so old school about it. So please, please have me back for any bass discussion you may have, sir. 
For sure. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And for everybody listening, please join in Living in the Limelight podcast on a weekly basis. We are again on Spotify and uh, YouTube. So please subscribe, uh, you know, like and subscribe. It doesn't cost anything and it really helps us musicians out. So stream our music, buy our music, uh, do what you can uh, and, uh, you know, support all of the local uh, bands that you possibly can. So again, Mark, thank you for joining us and we will talk to you all again. Again, very soon. Thank you. Thank you for joining our Living in the Limelight podcast with your host, Anton Scholl. Please feel free to comment, like, follow, share, and subscribe. And also add us to your playlist on your favorite streaming sites. Thanks again for joining, and we'll talk to you again next week.